know about you, but um, to know that as a believer, this is not my home brings some solace, does it not? Uh, it brings um, just the, the knowledge of knowing that whatever it is that I'm going through, no matter how difficult my day is, no matter what this world may hurl at me, it seems at times to know that this is not my home. And to know that uh, Christ is returning. And Christ will set up his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And to know that no matter what we go through, I constantly have to remind myself, as most of you know, I'm a part of a, uh, a college football team at Indiana, and, um, and it's tough, especially when, when, you, when you lose and you get back at 3 in the morning. And um, But I have to constantly remind myself that there is going to come a time where I'm going to be with my Savior in eternity, and that which that I think matters really doesn't matter. Yet what matters is um, the opportunity to present the gospel and truth to a group of young men and coaches, because that is eternal. Well, I feel better. I can now preach now. I had to get that off my chest. Um, we are in the book of 1 Peter, and I want to welcome those who are visiting with us today, some from out of town that, that we know and uh, grateful for them visiting. So thank you all for being here. And uh, for all you others who are visiting with us today uh, for the first time, uh, we're grateful to have you. But we've been going through the book of 1 Peter. And in the book of, um, of Peter, what we discussed a week before last, we had a missionary with us this past week. But before that, we talked about the importance for us as believers, though it may be difficult, we discussed how it is that we are to be in subject, in submission, if you will, to the governing authorities. Though it may not always be easy to, uh, to obey our government, and if it's situations that do not contradict the word of God, we are to be obedient unto them. We also learned that we are to be obedient uh, in the workplace. Maybe we work for a supervisor who um, is maybe doesn't necessarily always treat us fairly, doesn't treat us right. And we're not talking about someone who's physically or emotionally abusive. Obviously, you would not need to work for an individual like that. But an individual who doesn't physically or emotionally abuse, but they just don't treat you right. You do the right thing, and you don't get credit for it, and it's just hard to work for that individual. Yet we learn that we are to serve them uh, as well and be subject to their authority. Now, for some of us, that may be an easy task, but I would think for most of us that is very difficult. It's very difficult for us to submit when uh, we have to die to our rights of being right. Yet today, what we're going to see in 1 Peter chapter 2, as we finish it, verses 21 through 25, is we're going to see the reason why we are asked to be subjected to our governing authority and how we're to be servants, in a sense, and subject to our, uh, in the workplace, to those who may not treat us fairly. Why ultimately do we do this? Because we have an example, and that example is Christ. And the one thing that you can bank on when it comes to the word of God and it comes to Jesus is that he will never ask you or me to do something that he himself hasn't chosen to do. And so what we understand here as we read the passage, I'm going to read the verses and we're going to come back through and discuss them. Verse 21 is really based on verse 20. He made the comment in verse 20, or for what credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it and you endure it pretty much saying when you do something wrong and you get the consequent the punishment for doing something wrong and you make it through it what credit is that he says but if when you do the good if you do good and you suffer for it you endure this gracious thing in the sight of God and so he's comparing it that when you do the right thing when when you honor Christ and 
yet it doesn't work out always for you in these situations of submission. And that's our context. That God sees it. Because what ultimately was happening to these believers here is that um, they were in difficult situations. And the reason why it was so hard to submit to their government and the reason why it was so hard for them to submit in the workplace is because they were Christians. And to be Christians during this time was not something that was treated very highly. You were slandered against. You were persecuted against. Uh, you, you were made fun of. Uh, you were a different class of people. You weren't socially acceptable. You were an outcast. And yet, I'm still supposed to submit in that environment? And what Peter is saying is that when you do the right thing and you serve the Lord, and because you serve the Lord, you face these difficult individuals that you're having to submit to, it does not go unnoticed. He's saying God notices it. He notices it. And it's a gracious thing in his sight. Here's why. Verse 21 through 25. For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in the body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Will you join me as we pray over God's word? Lord, we come before you right now. We're asking for you to just continue to open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word today. Lord, let us receive it in such a way that we will apply it so that we will leave this place differently than the way we came. We are in such need of your grace and your mercy this morning. And we ask that through your word that you will just teach us a little bit more about who you are. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, God. For your name we pray. Amen. Well, he's just talked about when you suffer for doing right, and he says, for to this you have been called. Now, typically when we think about a calling and when we see in the scriptures about being called, it's obviously in most cases it's referring to salvation. But in this case, he's saying that you're called to a certain thing. He says, for to this you have been called. What's the this? The fact that we may have to suffer for doing right from following Christ within our society, within our workplace. It, it may get difficult. It may get hard. However, we are called to that kind of a lifestyle. Um, we are called. It's the activity of God's sovereign saving of us, but it's also this idea that he has not placed us in an easy world. Would you agree? He's not placed us in an easy world. But yet we're in this world and we're to be light in the midst of darkness. It's a special calling. It's a blessing. If, if we think about Jesus himself, what does it say? It says, for to this you have been called. Why? Because Christ also suffered for you. If Jesus had to suffer for you and me, guess what? It's okay if we may have to suffer as well. See, the, the Bible doesn't indicate for us as believers is that this concept of I come to know Christ and then everything just gets better. Life, life just works out. That I'm never going to have hardship. I'm never going to have discouragement. Um, I'm never going to get persecuted for my faith. 
uh, we talk about these missionaries. We have a missions report, and so many times that missions report in places that I've been before, it just gets, from the crowd's sake, it, it can easily get passed over. Now, these are individuals that are choosing to live in environments that probably in most cases aren't socially acceptable of what they're doing. And we as a church get to support them. We have it easy here. Oh, you should hear what he said about me. Really? When there are people in other countries that in situations like I am here today are concerned about somebody coming into their facility, dragging the individual uh, that's the pastor and myself out into the streets and either killing me, maiming me, harming my family, putting me in prison. We don't have that kind of persecution. Yet it's going on to Christians all across this world. No, my friends, it's to come to know Christ and accept Christ as our Lord and Savior is, is not necessarily a free lunch ticket. We may have difficulties. We may have hardships. But when we persevere, when we follow Christ, when we live for Christ in the midst of this, when we suffer in a sense as he has suffered, it is looked upon as God as a gracious thing. You see, in order for Christ to gain the crown of glory, he had to first have a crown of thorns. I'm going to say that again. In order for Christ to have the crown of glory, he must first, he first had to wear what? A crown of thorns. He had to suffer. But here's the thing. He suffered for nothing he did. No, he suffered for what I do. He suffered for what you do. He suffered for that which he had no part of. That's the kind of God we serve. So if I'm in a situation, it be at work or our government, and it's not something that's contradicting to the word of God, and I may have to go through a little stress, a little uh, persecution, and a little, I'm working hard, but it's not getting noticed. Understand that Jesus suffered for you as well. And if he can do it, guess what? So can you. And so can I. Notice he says, because Christ also suffered for you. What's the outcome? Leaving you an example. Why ultimately did Christ suffer for you and me? He left us an example and we look at this word example and you really study it, what it literally means, it's the process that a child goes through when an elementary student is tracing their letters. You remember that when, when, you, when you first had the, the big pages and, and you had the big block lines and you had like the like, kind of like the dotted line that kind of went in between the two lines and you had to keep your letters in between the two lines? I was not a good keep letters in between the two lines kind of guy. And I remember, in our, especially when you got to cursive. Kids, they don't even know what cursive is. You talk, have you used cursive? They think you're talking about cuss words, right? <laughs> no, no, cursive was the way you used to write. We have no idea what that is anymore. And I remember when I first had to learn how to write cursive, it is what it is. I had to be that kid that had the sheet with it already on there, and I had to trace that bad boy <laughs> over and over again until I can understand how to write in cursive. That's the same word. Christ suffered on our behalf, why? To be an example. To be an example for you and for me, why? So that, here's the why, you might, I might, these believers might follow in his steps. It's the only place you see that phrase in the New Testament. What does it mean by following in his steps? It's literally what it means. It's the idea that I remember as uh, when we used to live in Tennessee and as our kids were growing up. And I remember uh, it very rarely happens, but we get snow every once in a while. I know here it's, it's normal. Tennessee is not very normal. And I remember one time we got a really good snow. And I just remember there was a certain way to walk, um, a certain path that wasn't as deep. And I remember when my kids were younger, I would walk in front of them. And I would tell them 
you step your foot in daddy's footprint. Wherever my footprint goes, you put your foot in that footprint. And so you see a 12 and a half size shoe, and then you see a little bitty shoe, right? Because they would follow me out the right path. Because if not, we, got some, we would get drifts. They would walk, and it would be up to their, I mean, they'd just fall right in, right? And it'd be up to their armpits. And me being a gracious, loving father, I didn't really want to pull them out of the snow. <laughs> so follow my steps. Because if you stay, if you fall in it, hey, we'll, 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 <laughs> you'll be there when we get back, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so, but they would walk in my steps. That's the same thing that Jesus is saying here, that he was an example. Why? So we would walk in his steps. What's the context? He had to suffer. Though he did right, he had to suffer. Guess what? Though we may do right in this life, we may follow the Lord, and we may have to suffer as well. He's not asking you or me to do anything that he has not already done. What does it say about him? It says, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Oh, we get this idea that of him committing no sin. He wasn't just perfect and above the human law. He was also seen as perfect and pleasing under God's law. Uh, he, he, didn't just, he didn't just obey the, the, the human laws like he's, we're being asked to do by Peter, like they were asked to do, these believers. No, he also was obedient in following God's law. He did it to completion and to perfection. Because at the end of the day, one of the main reasons why Jesus went to the cross was to be obedient to his father. And he was found obedient. He committed no sin. So therefore, he was innocent by human law, and he was also innocent before a holy God. It talks about how there was no deceit in his mouth. The idea of deceit is he claimed to be who he was. They tried him, and in their opinion, they found that him not to be God. Yet Peter is sitting here saying, no, he is God. We know that he is God, and there was no deceit found in his mouth. He committed no sin. All of that is prophetic about him. We also know that it says in verse 23, it says, when he was reviled, how was he reviled? Well, he was, spat on, he was spat on. They spit on him. They grabbed his beard. They made fun of him. They put a crown of thorns and crushed it on his head. They mocked him. They flogged him. With a cat of nine tails, 39 times, because it was thought that they hit you to 40 if you'd die. And yet, though they reviled him, he did not revile in return. It'd be a whole different gospel story if we read that when he was reviled, <laughs> he hit him back. It'd be a totally different gospel story, would it not? When they pulled his beard, he pulled theirs. But he didn't. But he didn't. Again, it was prophetic. It was prophetic. Prophecy had said this would happen to him, and yet he wouldn't revile back. He's our example. It says when he suffered. He did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That word entrusting is in the imperfect tense. It means to continue to trust that even in the midst of his suffering, even in the midst of his suffering for, for something that he didn't even do, he wasn't guilty. All the fake trials they had of Jesus, none of them found him guilty. Pilate himself says, I find nothing wrong with him. Who do you want? And they chose Barabbas. 
and we've studied him before because we are Barabbas. We were the ones that deserved to be killed and yet were set free, and the one who should have been set free was the one who ultimately died, and that was Jesus. He suffered, and in that moment, he says that he continued entrusting himself to God, knowing that ultimately who judges justly? God judges justly. And he lived the kind of life knowing that at the end of the day, I only have one judge, and that's the God, that's God Almighty. It's God Almighty is my only judge. So you and I may treat people a certain way. We may think we're getting away with certain things. We may look at our world and we see the news and we see individuals who are awful, who are evil, who do harmful things, and we think, okay, how is this allowed? Can I tell you there's going to come a time and place where they're going to stand before a holy judge, and they will have to give an account for it. Yeah, they may, have, they may have thought they made it and missed out on earthly judgment, but there will come a time and place where they will have to stand before a righteous, holy God. And during this time of suffering, Jesus entrusted not only himself, but he entrusted these individuals. What do we know that Jesus said while he was on the cross? Father, what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them for their ignorance. They don't have a clue what they're doing. He was entrusting them. He was entrusting himself to a God who ultimately judges justly. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Interesting use of words. He bore our sins, which means he took your sins and my sins, the believer's sins that he's writing to here in Peter, sins in his body. And where, where was the location? On the tree. Now, we may look at that in the simplest way possible. Well, obviously, he died on a cross. The cross is made out of wood. It ultimately comes from a tree. But Paul, to the church of Galatians, in quoting a passage in Deuteronomy, talks about this concept to the Jewish people that cursed was anyone who died upon a tree. In Deuteronomy, if you, in, in the old law, if you had somebody who was a criminal and he committed a crime and his punishment was death on a tree, you didn't allow his body to stay up there longer than about a 24-hour period. And you were to take it down. That individual was put on a tree to die because it was looked at as he was cursed. So when Jesus went to the cross, he went to the cross. Peter puts it this way. His body was on a tree. Paul, again in Galatians, refers to it as curses anyone who is, dies on a tree. He became a curse because of sin, because of your sin, and because of my sin. So if anyone has the right to complain about suffering unjustly, it would be Jesus. And yet we find him in this passage, we find him silent before a holy God. before his persecutors. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? That we might. Why did he do it? Here's our answer. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. His purpose on the cross, his purpose for suffering unjustly Ultimately, being obedient to God was so that you and I would understand the significance of dying to sin. It doesn't mean, we all know that we live in this fleshly earth suit. It doesn't mean that I'm never going to sin. But I, because of the Holy Spirit living in me, 
with God's help, staying in his word, I should strive, you should strive each and every day not to give into a lifestyle of sin. He went to the cross so we would be dead to it. Dead to sin, live to righteousness. You can't have it both ways. You can't be dead to righteousness and live in sin, and yet at the same time die to sin and live in righteousness. You can't have that kind of life. The book of 1 John lets us know that. You can't live with one foot in the world and one foot in God's word. It doesn't work that way. You can't ride the fence. The devil owns it. But so many times we can find ourselves walking through this life and we're on this fine line, this tightrope, where we could fall either way. And what Peter is saying, what the gospel teaches us is that when Christ went to the cross and he suffered unjustly, in a sense, was innocent, yet he did it for you and me, he did it, why? So that you and I would die to sin and live to righteousness. Righteousness, a place of being right before God. Then we get, the, we get the, the culmination of it all. By his wounds, you have been healed. See, that's the first aspect of salvation is realizing that you're what? Sick. And you need to be healed. Or there are obviously probably some in this room, or if not in this room, you know of someone that, they just haven't gotten there yet. They haven't realized that I'm sick and I'm in need of a healer. I'm lost and I'm in need of a savior. And here he is. And it's by his wounds you and I have been healed. Verse 25, for you are straying like sheep. We've talked in this congregation about what does it mean to be a sheep. Sheep was one of the dumbest animals ever to be created. And I may, some of y'all may get sad. That's just true. If you leave a sheep out in the pasture by itself, it'll eat all the grass around itself and then it will starve and die because it's too dumb to go over here and get more grass. That's why a sheep has to have a what? Shepherd. Sheep, we've talked about it before, is the, is the weakest of all animals. It has no self-defense mechanism. What's a sheep going to do? Think about it. Some, some animal comes in to, to, to attack it. You think that sheep's going to outrun something? You can't outrun something when your legs are about this long. It don't happen. Are they going to try to hide? No. A sheep left out in the wilderness by itself is known as lunch. That's what they're known as. Now, if you have a sheep with a shepherd, it's the strongest of all animals. Especially in today's world, you go over to the Middle East and you find a shepherd, they're not carrying a stab, they're carrying an AK. <laughs> they're carrying a gun. But we get termed, the book of John talks about it this way, we get termed as sheep. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Feel good about yourself? God calls us sheep, calls us dumb. Without him, without our shepherd, we're lunch. But guess what? It's true. Without Christ, not only does Satan eat your lunch every day, he eats your mama's note, he eats it all. We were strained. These believers were straying like sheep. They had gone away but have now returned. I'm going to be honest. There may be some of you in this room today that... that that's a call for you. You need to return. You need to return to him. It says, you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to who? The shepherd. It's a Jewish term. It's kind of interesting. He uses the word shepherd. It's a Jewish term. And then he says, an overseer of your souls. The overseer, uh, it, it's looked at as a, what a, how a pagan would refer to their God as as they would look at their gods as someone who watched over them. Peter uses it to, to tell a truth about Jesus. He's not only our shepherd, he's not only one that takes care of us, that goes before us, that watches up, but he also watches over you and me. He knows what's going on. 
See, we are not, we don't, we don't just have the, um, uh, the ability to be free from eternal pain and judgment, but we've also been given the opportunity to be free from a life of sin. He's our shepherd. He leads us. He guides us. He directs us as his sheep, but he's also our overseer. He watches over you and me. Watches over you and me. Well, a lot of this passage of scripture comes out of one chapter in the Old Testament. And I'm going to close by just reading this chapter. A lot of these verses come, cross reference, out of Isaiah uh, 53. I'll read a few of these verses if you want to turn there with me. Isaiah 53. As we close, why is it that you and I may have to suffer for doing what is right? Why do we continue to do it? Because he did it. And he's not going to ask you or me to do anything that he hasn't already done. Uh, That's why I titled this message, Follow the Leader. I remember as a kid having to follow the leader in school. We had a kid named Billy, and I didn't really like Billy. I didn't much like following Billy. But when I got out of line and the teacher made me get back in line, I had to follow Billy. We may not always like to do what God's word calls us to do. However, there is an umbrella of protection. And when we get out from underneath that umbrella of protection, we get rained on. So as we read chapter 53, I want you to look at our leader who we get to follow by his grace and his mercy. It says, who has believed what he has heard from us? And again, Isaiah wrote this 500 something years before Jesus was ever born. So just store that in your memory bank. This was written hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was even alive. Let us know that there's no way Isaiah would have known this unless God, who knows it all, told him because God is the ultimate author of our scripture. It says, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, referring to our sin. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, sound familiar? We just read it. We are healed. Also, what do we looked at in verse 6? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him. He suffered for you, what Peter said, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, here's the prophecy, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as far as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off of the land of the living? stricken for the transgression of my people and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth sound familiar all of these are prophetic they're prophecies that came true there's over 300 prophecies on Jesus that have come that have been that have been given on Jesus that have come true. Here are some of them. And here's the verse I want you to hear and we're going to close with. All that we've just read about our leader says, yet 
It was the will of the Lord, talking about Yahweh, talking about God, to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring and he shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Don't miss verse 10 as we close. Yet it pleased God to crush him. It pleased God to crush him. Jesus' death on the cross was pleasing to God. See, God's plans and God's desires aren't always our plans and our desires. Jesus' death on the cross for you and me was found pleasing to his eyes. So for us and for these believers in Peter, though we may suffer, we have the confidence and assurance that though we may suffer in this life, we are not lost for Jesus is always with us and we are always under his care my prayer for you is that you know him today and if you don't my prayer is, is that you will come to know him as our worship team comes I'm gonna close in prayer father God we love you we thank you we need you we thank you for this passage of scripture that's a clear reminder of how good you are how faithful you are and how much we desperately need you. I don't know where people are in this room. It would be very easy to assume everybody in this room knows you as their Savior. But only you know the heart. And so I pray if there's anyone here that does not know you as our Lord and Savior, that today would be that day of salvation. I also pray if there's those of us in this room that we know you as Savior, but we haven't really been living like we should. That today will be the day that we say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get serious with you, Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surrender fully to you. Because you're that good. I pray they will do that today as well. But we pray for those who are sick and in our need of healing. We ask for your miraculous healing. But bless this day and bless those who are here. In Christ's name we pray.